Good morning. Thank you, wake up call. Good morning to you too, Anderson. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, say a, a brief word about the Dakota Marketplace. Um, Michelle talked about a little bit earlier. Because it is one of the, the ways that we as United Methodists in the Dakotas raise money for world hunger. And it's been so successful over the many years. And, and one of the reasons that they've moved it here to Sioux Falls is because the market has kind of, I think, uh, become saturated over the years with selling quilts in the Mitchell area. So they're looking for new buyers. And uh, if you know of some people, and you know, maybe you're one of them, but uh, otherwise if you know of some people who, who might be interested in purchasing those quilts, because they do bring, bring a lot of money. And our, our ladies here have, have uh, quilted one that will be there as well. But I certainly want to encourage you to, to encourage others to come down and, and to be a part of that and to remember that um, I think about half of the money that is raised actually stays in the Dakotas and and one of the projects locally that is used is over at Wesley United Methodist Church where they have a, a feeding program and they get a grant from this. So uh, it, it doesn't all go miles away. Some of it stays right here close by. I hope that you will uh, mark it on your calendar and plan to be a part of that in uh, just, just less than two weeks now. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at the uh, scripture reading from James. It's the uh, New Testament reading for today, for the uh, 15th Sunday after Pentecost. And James was concerned with the way people were living out their faith, or probably more correctly, the way they were not living out their faith. And his basic claim was, it's not enough to talk the Christian faith, we must live it. And in the verse immediately following the scripture that we'll consider for today, James says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions. Genuine faith will inevitably produce good deeds. Genuine faith will inevitably produce good deeds. So reading from James chapter 2 and verses 1 through 13. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here please, while to the one who is poor you say, oh, stand over there or, or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who, who oppress you. Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, 
you shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, most of us can probably remember our time spent on the playground while we were growing up. Sometimes maybe we played baseball, sometimes perhaps football or some other sport. And when it came time to choose sides, there was always the same group of kids who were the very last to be chosen. Nobody really wanted them on their team. I remember that well because I was usually in that group being as non-athletic as, as I am. Probably says something about, you know, how I always go for the underdog. You know, the Vikings, <laughs> Nebraska, you know. Yeah, ouch, you got it. <laughs> That's what I'm usually saying. Well, I suspect it still happens today. And why not? I mean, children see adults doing the very same things. And sometimes even in the church. We look at people, we evaluate them, and then we decide if we want them to play on our team or not. That's the way of the world. And sometimes, unfortunately, it is also the way of the church. But James tells us in the scripture for this morning that we're not to show favoritism. That means we're not to favor one person over another person because of what they have or because of how perhaps what they have might benefit us. James then goes on to illustrate his point by sharing about something that he had probably witnessed in the church. He talked about a rich man walking into the church and a poor man walking into the church and he wanted to know to which one would the best seat be offered. Now you're probably wondering, well, where are the best seats? Well, I want to tell you the best seats are right up here in the front. And I would love for some of you to try out the best seats in the house sometime, right up here in the front, right up here where the rich folk are seated. Well, probably not so. But that's the way it was. The rich people would, would get the best seat wherever it was. And the poor folk, well, who knows? And James said, if that's the way you're evaluating things, you're showing favoritism. And so we ought to consider the same question today. If a rich person walked in and at the same time a, a poor person walked in, which one would you be more interested in? Which one might you invite to, to sit with you? Or which one would you prefer to, to have join the church? And if your answer is, well, the, the rich person, then you might be guilty of, of favoritism. Because when we consider one person of greater value over another person, that's just wrong. Catering to the rich and the powerful while, while neglecting the needy is wrong in the sight of God. And none of us likes it when we get passed over because someone else is playing favorites. 
You know, it's probably happened to most of us before, and we don't like that. And so we shouldn't do it either, and especially we shouldn't do it in the church. Favoritism is certainly not the way God operates. Listen to what is written in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. All of that, <laughs> just to build up to this, who does not show partiality, nor take a bribe. The awesome God that we sang about this morning does not show partiality nor can he be bribed. And when we reject a person based on, on outward appearance, we make a serious mistake. You see, it's an insult to God because God has created that person in his image. When we judge someone based on how they look or whatever, that's an insult to God because that person has been created in the image of God. All people are created in God's image. So why do we do it? Why do we, why do we sometimes play favorites? Well, usually it's because we have selfish motives. When a child on the playground shows favoritism, it's because he or she wants the best players on his or her team. Why? So that they can win, of course. And as adults, we play favorites for selfish reasons as well. We often make decisions based on what can we get out of it? How will this decision benefit me? What's in it? for me? What's the best for me? And that goes against the biblical definition of love. Biblical love never looks at something for, for selfish reasons. What can I get out of it? Biblical love always focuses on the other person. So it's what can I do for that person? How can I help that person? Not what can they do for me? James really lays it on the line in verse, uh, verse 9. He puts it in language I think we all can understand. He says, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. That's pretty plain. It's not murder, it's not adultery, and yet, he says, showing favoritism is a sin. It goes against God's design. And James reminds us that a sin is a sin. In the eyes of God, showing favoritism is just as bad as anything else we might call sin. And sometimes we find that hard to believe. I mean, oh, it's, yeah, showing favoritism, yeah, that's wrong. But James says, no, it's more than that. It's sin. And sin is sin. And so it needs to be confessed, and forgiveness needs to be received. When it comes to our interactions with other people, we need to question our own motives. Are our motives based on what we can be, what we can get out of it, or so that we can be seen hanging around with the rich and the famous? <laughs> or are our motives pure? As Christians, our motives ought to simply be to extend the hand of Jesus Christ to everyone. That is a pure motive. And if that's your motive, you'll be able to see through the diamonds and the dirt, through the money and the muck, the wealth and the welfare, to see the one 
who really needs Jesus Christ. In 1884, a young man died. And after the funeral, his grieving parents decided that they wanted to establish a memorial to him. And with that in mind, they met with Charles Eliot, who was then president of Harvard University. Remember, this is back in 1884. Eliot received the rather ragged-looking couple into his office, and he asked them what he could do for them. And after they expressed their desire to fund a, a memorial, Eliot quite impatiently said, well, perhaps you have in mind a scholarship. Well, we were thinking of something more substantial than that, perhaps a building, the woman replied. And in a patronizing tone, Eliot brushed aside the idea of as being too expensive. And pretty soon the couple departed. Well, the next year, Eliot learned that this plain couple had gone elsewhere and established a $26 million memorial. I was told after the first worship service that maybe 26 million doesn't mean that much today so I should say what that would be in today's dollars and he had figured out during the rest of my sermon I suppose <laughs> that it was probably about two billion dollars in in today's money so 26 million then two billion that this plain pair had had established uh, with a place named Leland Stanford Junior University, better known today as Stanford. <laughs> when you look at other people, what do you see? Do you judge them by how they look, what they're wearing, how they talk, and who do you choose? Who do you choose to play on your team, if you will? Do you judge others by what you see? And if that's the case, well, you know, we really shouldn't do that. Because we oftentimes, we don't know the other people. And we generally do not know their story. They, we don't know who they are or what they've been through. And so regardless of what they look like, all people stand in need of the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. And that should be our concern. The church is the one place on earth, and Christians are the one group on earth that should seek to make life equal. Where we don't play favorites. And that's what Jesus did at the cross. Jesus died for all, and there were no questions asked. Let us pray. God, forgive us because sometimes we can be quite judgmental. We look, we see, we judge. And sometimes we don't take the time to get to know the other person, to hear their story. And we don't just offer them Christ. Forgive us. And help us to be accepting of all people, not to play favorites. And we thank you. We thank you that you do not play favorites. We thank you for Jesus, who gave his life for all of us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.